Dear Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for the blessings of the day. Your blessings come to us each and every day. Help us to open our eyes to see all the wonderful things that you have planned for us and how you continue to bless us and uh, lead us and guide us in our daily living. Lord, we ask that uh, you be with us and to guide us through uh, the book of Esther as uh, we begin this Bible study today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. <coughs> Okay, uh, last week uh, we started the, the plot, so to speak, against uh, uh, the Judeans. Uh, and so I will admit, at this point, the book kind of moves very, very quickly uh, because uh, the plot now happens. So we'll talk about Haman uh, and the plot against, uh, you could say, uh, the Jews. And so we're in uh, uh, Esther chapter 3. Uh, and let's uh, continue on with uh, verse uh, 7. In the first month, uh, which is the month of uh, Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Hashuaritz, they cast pur, uh, that is, they cast lots before Haman day after day, and they cast it month after month till the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar. Then Haman said to King Hashuaritz, There is a certain people scattered abroad, and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdoms. Their laws are, not, are different from those of every other people, and they do not keep the king's law, so that it is not to the king's profit to tolerate them. Just as a little bit of a backdrop, uh, what happened, uh, what we heard uh, last week was uh, Mordecai, uh, did not want to bow down to uh, Haman. Uh, and now Haman is using, he's sort of second to the king. He's using that position to sit there and say, you know, there's a group of people, referring to the Jews, who will only bow down to God, not to another man. Um, and Haman is basically saying to the king, uh, there's a group of people and they don't follow your laws. Okay, so it's not to the king's profit Okay, keep this in mind. Notice how Haman is trying to work with the king. It's not to your advantage. You're not going to be making money here. Okay, uh, yes? What does it mean they were casting lots before Haman? What is that? Uh, we, we don't know. We don't know. Casting of lots could be for many things. Um, you know, if you want to think of uh, dice, rolling dice. Uh, almost like a form of entertainment. Just also keep in mind that they also cast lots. Uh, I think today is actually the day we celebrate uh, Matthias, the apostle, uh, to replace Judas. And how was he chosen? Mm -hmm. Casting of lots. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, it's, it's one of those things where it's a little bit vague and uh, different uh, commentators and uh, will in put uh, their own version of what those lots were. Uh, but if you want to assume it as a, a game of chance, you may, because that's what kind of lots are. Um, and so, yeah, Hilda? My Bible says, um, the poor or lot, the Hebrew text preserves the Akkadian word per, because it's plural purim, and that's a holiday, a Jewish holiday, purim, yeah. um, became the name of the Feast of Purim, commemorating the deliverance of the Jews. Uh, the lot functions as a kind of horoscope to determine the most favorable day for the program. Yeah, uh, and, and Purim would actually be developed a little bit later on in the book of uh, Esther, but they do give uh, this, uh, they cast Pur, that is the casting of lots, uh, uh, and this was between the king and uh, Ham, uh, Haman, um, and exactly what that is, we really don't know, but it could have been a form of entertainment. Maybe it was a little bit of, as your Bible kind of picks up, of uh, trying to predict the future. Uh, we don't know. I'm going to kind of leave it a little vague at this point. So right now we have Haman, and he's going to be going after the Jews because Mordecai refused to bow down to him. And he basically says, you know, I'm Jewish. We're going to be only bowing down to God. And so Haman basically says to the king, you know, there's these people. They're, they're throughout your whole kingdom here, and they follow a different set of laws. Now, that's really true. 
If you think about it, even as Christians, do we not say we'd rather obey God than man? Mm -hmm. That means, according to the state and our government, we also follow a different set of laws. Now, I will admit, as Christians, uh, we are told to obey the state, okay, uh, and to follow the state as long as the state doesn't tell us to disobey God. So, we're not necessarily enemies of the state, per se, uh, but yet, um, if if you're a government and you want total control of people, you might want to keep your eye out on those Christians because you're not going to get total control of them. We're going to say we are God's creatures. We belong to God. So in one essence, we could fall into this exact same category. So just keep that in mind, uh, especially in today's world where, you know, where there seems to be a little bit more of a power grab and but as christians ultimately our loyalty belongs to christ and so we're not going to do something that is opposed to what christ tells us in his word uh, so in one essence we could fall into this exact same category uh, so now let's continue on as uh, Haman says uh, so that it is not to the king's profit to tolerate them Haman then continu um, uh, continues, verse 9, If it please, please the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who have charge of the king's business, so that they may put it to, into the king's treasury. So the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman uh, the Agite. And the son of uh, Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, The money is given to you, the people also, to do with them as it seems good to you. So let's just try to unpack this, first of all, to find out what's going on here. Haman doesn't like Mordecai, un, uh, unwilling to bow down to him. So he says, let's just commit genocide. We're going to wipe out the entire Jewish race here. Uh, because we want to, I want to sell this idea to the king, I will contribute, Haman's going to contribute 10,000 uh, talents of silver. Okay, And so you could say the king accepts this bribe because that's really what Haman's trying to do. I want to bribe you to motivate you to sign this decree so I can eliminate the Jewish people. Okay. Uh, and the, so the king gives his approval. Wow, an exchange of money to wipe somebody out. It almost goes back to the mindset of, you know, Judas being paid to betray Jesus. But uh, guess who is the active agent here? Uh, that is uh, Haman, and then the king allows it. So think of this from the, from the king's point of view. He would rather have 10,000 pieces of silver than a whole group of people who Haman presented to him as troublemakers. Well, you get rid of the troublemakers and you profit with a little extra money into the piggy bank? Sounds like a good deal, right? Mm -hmm. Except for just think of the genocide that's being committed along with that. Uh, so uh, that's the, that's the, uh, the main uh, thing that's being set up here. Uh, so then let's go on to uh, verse uh, 12. Then the king's scribes were summoned on the 13th day of the first month, and an edict, according to all that Haman commanded, was written to the king's uh, satraps and to the governors over all the provinces and to the officials of all the peoples, to every province in its own script and every people in its own language. It was written in the name of King Hashuerus and sealed with the king's signet ring. So now the proclamation goes out, okay, that, um, guess what? The Jews are going to be uh, wiped out. Let's go on to verse 13. Letters were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with instructions to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all Jews, young and old, women and children, 
in one day, the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is the day of Ador, and to plunder their goods. A copy of the document was to be issued as a decree in every province by proclamation to all the peoples to be ready for that day. The couriers were sent out hurriedly by order of the king, and the decree was issued in Susa, the citadel. And the king and Haman sat down to drink. But the city of Susa was thrown into confusion. Wow, so it gives you another interesting news site, insight here. So Haman and the king, eh, they were living it up here. Hey, this is a good thing. But the people in the, the town, uh, Susa, they were put into a little bit of turmoil here. We don't know exactly what the population percentage was of Jewish people, but we do know Mordecai was there. And we also do know and remember that Esther, the queen, is also Jewish. Yes? Uh, to encourage the genocide, they are offering those who are going to come to commit the crimes by give, saying you can plunder the people so all their possessions, all their gold, all yep. their, whatever they have will be yours if you kill them. I know, isn't it? That's, that's extra incentive. <laughs> Yeah, you don't like your neighbor, mm -hmm. or you really covet your neighbor. That only happens in today's world. It never happened back then, right? You cover it what your neighbors have, right? Uh, so you know, extra incentive of who's going to be doing the uh, the nasty work, so to speak. You know, it's almost like the Pontius Pilate uh, concept. Let me just wash my hands. I really am not doing this. Oh, but I'm providing the incentive for others to do it. Oh, that's okay. Mm -hmm. But my hands are clean, right? No. Okay, so you can see the tension building here. Okay, so I want to take a little bit of a break from Scripture. I want to go to our uh, church father here for a moment, uh, who is going to uh, bring a, a very interesting uh, uh, part here. He's going to say, The fact that the twelfth month, which is called Adar, uh, was chosen for the destruction of Israel after casting lots is not with its own spiritual meaning. It is referring, in fact, to the grace of Christ, which has been prepared for the faithful in the fullness of time, when the faithful will undergo a fierce persecution in the world in the last days. And writing about this to Timothy, to the teacher of the Gentiles, you must understand this, that in the last days distressing times will come. So it's interesting what I liked about this particular quote from uh, this uh, early church father is that he's sort of superimposing something that as Christians we always keep in the back of our mind. When Christ comes again on the last day we always think it's going to be very very distressing as uh, scripture points out and it is. It's going to be, okay? There's going to be a lot of bad things that are happening. But what's interesting is that he, he actually superimposes this idea on an Old Testament account. And so what, what's beautiful about that is we have to remember throughout all of history, there has always been some very dark times. And what has happened after those dark times? God brings deliverance. And so there's almost like an up and down theme of light and darkness, light and darkness. And sometimes people think there's a tug of war between light and darkness, between good and bad. And in some uh, religions they actually think that uh, this is going to be an ongoing battle and because each of one is like 50% uh, they're, they're equal to each other. However, it's that last statement which is not true. The darkness is never equal to the light of Christ. We know that Christ defeated sin, death, and the devil. So while we see the distressing times, we know ultimately how it's going to end. It's going to end with Satan and his minions being tossed into hell. Christ and his followers uh, entering into the paradise. And that's how it's going to end. 
So it's not a 50-50 or you're seeing this tension between good and evil and they always have to battle with one another. God is allowing this for a particular purpose. And so we need to realize that uh, all of this is going to happen uh, under God's design. So when we see distressing times, even in today's world, yeah, we should always return back to God and his work, look forward to his strength and his guidance in our daily lives, but to realize that this may be the sign of the last time, but we've been living in those last days ever since Christ uh, ascended into heaven and realize that, yes, we're going to have some very dark days, but then again, uh, God has always rescued us. So just keep that in the back of our mind. Yes, Hilda. Um, whenever that has happened where people stray from God mm -hmm. and evil prevails, mm -hmm. um, it doesn't say it's like 50-50. Correct. It says God leave, always leaves a, a remnant. remnant. Right. And a remnant to me doesn't sound like 50%. Okay, you, you're right. Uh, and so I was not... I don't. I didn't want to associate those two terms. What I was referring to the 50-50 is that our world takes a look at the power of darkness being equal to the power of light, and that is not true. Okay, that's not a 50-50. Christ has defeated, completely defeated, uh, the darkness, and so uh, there isn't like the darkness is just as equal to the power of light. Those are. <coughs> that's completely false. So uh, what, what you brought with that was, and that was probably a little bit of, uh, I should have taught that a little bit better or said those words a little bit better. Uh, but you're right, when um, God did allow the exile to occur, there was always a remnant. And that remnant was not equal to 50%, you're right. Uh, but we don't know how big that re remnant was. There was always believers, and we don't know exactly how many uh, those believers are. And if you go back to the time of, um, say, Elijah, when he thought he was pretty much the only one left, God kind of laughs and says, no, there are over 7,000 who have not bowed down to uh, Baal. So we don't always know those numbers, but God knows those numbers. It's not for us to know and to count. God knows and everything is in his uh, plan. But let me continue on. I have one more quote from uh, this early church father. For people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, inhuman, implacable, uh, slanderers, uh, pro, pro... Wow, I can't even read that very well. And you almost need to get a better screen here, but uh, brutes, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding the outward form of godliness but denying its power. Wow. And the Lord himself says in the gospel, and the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. And a bit further, for at that time there will be great suffering, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now and never will be. So again, you have the, the scriptural idea that people, of course, are doing their own thing. And they're very much uh, focused on doing their own thing. Um, but yet, even in the midst of all of this, you still have God's activity. Uh, the gospel will still be proclaimed, even in the midst of a, a culture and a world that is becoming more and more self-focused upon themselves and not following God. That will not stop that word of God to continue to go out. Uh, and so, yes, there will be a lot of suffering. Um, but we also know that God is still with us, even in the midst of that suffering. So we're, we're back at, let me get back to um, uh, Esther here. Uh, so we, we found out that the Jews are going to be wiped out at a certain day, at a certain time. And now we're moving to the next uh, section, which is Esther agrees to help the Judeans. Because you've got to remember at this point, Esther has not revealed her nationality. No one knows her family background. But it has been decreed that the Jewish people would die. So now, in back of Esther's mind, when she finds out, 
she's going to have to struggle. Should I reveal my identity or should I just allow my people to suffer and I escape? So we kind of know what's going to be the problem, but now let's uh, see how uh, Esther chapter 4 unfolds. Verse 1. When Mordecai learned all that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city and he cried out with a loud and bitter cry. And I'm liking this to or having as a parallel from Jonah chapter 3 verse 6. The word reached the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself in sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Why did the king of Nineveh do this? Because Jonah was walking through Nineveh and proclaiming, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. Same parallel theme here. The destruction of a people sometime in the future, okay? For Jonah, uh, for the Ninevites, uh, they would, uh, I should say, the people of Nineveh would repent, okay? Uh, for Mordecai, did he have anything to repent of? Not really, okay? I mean, yes, he's a sinner, just like all of us are sin, uh, sinners, but this evil that is coming upon Mordecai is because uh, Mordecai has been remaining faithful to God's people. So there's a, there is a difference between Nineveh, which they were called to repent, and Mordecai uh, and the Jewish people at this point uh, because of the evil of Haman. But notice the same response. Let's put on sackcloth and ashes. And so what happens in the church year on Wednesday? Ash Wednesday. Ash Wednesday, yeah, where ashes have always been used as that sign of repentance, that sign of reminding that from dust we are to dust we shall return. And so when we begin the season of Lent, we, of course, uh, celebrate Ash Wednesday and we have the imposition of ashes. Uh, and just as a reminder, where do I get my ashes from? The palm branches. Yeah, the palm branches from last year's uh, Palm Sunday. We have uh, we always have some extras, and then they get burned. Uh, and I like to do that with the Sunday school students, and so that'll happen on uh, Sunday. So Sunday's Bible class will be just a little bit of a delayed start, but nothing major. Okay, so we have um, uh, Mordecai. Let's just go back to Mordecai for a moment. Not only is he going to put on sackcloth and ashes. Uh, and he did tear his clothes, which is also another sign of uh, distress. But now he's going to go out in the midst of the city, and he's going to cry with a loud, bitter cry. And maybe that was part of the confusion that we heard a little bit earlier from the end of chapter 3. That you had the Jewish people who got this proclamation, they're going to be wiped out, and what would their response be? Come, Lord Jesus, come. This is going to be great, right? Yeah. No, they're going to be crying out to God, okay? And they are going to be saying uh, and letting the community know they're not happy, okay? But notice what they're not doing. They're not destroying the community either. That's one of the things we need to learn in today's society so that when a group of people get a little upset with what's happening in the community, they don't destroy the community, they actually just put on the sackcloth and ashes for themselves, and they cry. Just a little side note there. Okay, let's go to verse uh, 2. Uh, referring to Mordecai, He went up to the entrance of the king's gate, for no one was allowed to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. And in every province, wherever the king's command and his decree reached, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting and weeping and lamenting, and many of them laid in sackcloth and ashes. What's interesting about this text here is it says many of them, not necessarily all of them. Remember, the Jewish people were put into exile because of their disobedience. Maybe not all of them did want to return to Christ uh, or return back to uh, believing and trusting in God. Uh, but it just says many of them. 
And notice they already started not only the sackcloth, but also the fasting. And we'll be talking about fasting a little bit later when we get closer to uh, what Esther is going to do. Uh, so again, uh, now we have the Jewish people reacting to this decree. They're not happy about it, and they're letting the community know that they're not happy without being destructive. But now let's go to my, our church father for a moment. He writes, When Mordecai heard about the destruction of the Jews, which had been sanctioned with an imperial decree, he put on clothes for mourning and proceeded to the gates of the palace with bitterness in his soul and grief in his voice. In the same way, after the teachers of the church hear of the persecution, which the princes of this world want to bring against the, the innocent servants of Christ, they come <coughs> with their prayers and alms, with vigils and players and t with tears and heavy hearts in view of what they m know must happen. So the early church father here is understanding this and saying, guess what, even the Christian church is under persecution. And when the Christian church is under persecution, the leaders of the church should also, very similar, like put on sackcloth and ashes. We also should be mourning. But now here's an interesting question. Is the Christian church still under persecution? Yes. Every religion is under persecution. Yeah. So even today, Christianity is still being persecuted. But yet... How often do we hear about this, about some of the details? Do we, are we often, do we, um, do we put, wear a sackcloth and ashes? It's almost become where it's become so quote unquote normal <laughs> that we hear about Christians being persecuted. We, we quickly go back to our daily living without even maybe a moment to pause and just saying, okay, the Lord, can you just give them strength even in the midst of persecution? And so what happens, to, what is going on within each and every one of us when we hear and we know of Christians being persecuted, but yet we don't stop to pause. We just continue on with our life. Not me. Doesn't okay. Me. <laughs> okay, so yeah, we, we should take that moment to pause and to sit there and say, wait a minute, what's going on here? Lord, help us. Because that's exactly what Mordecai was doing. Uh, he wasn't wanting to just give in to this. And he wasn't so attached to the world that he sat there and he said, eh, it really doesn't matter. I'm just going to go do my own thing. We'll just sort of see how this all ends up. But uh, so I think the challenges should still be put before the Christian church today that we should be concerned about our fellow Christians about some of the persecutions and the sufferings that they are enduring in this world. Yes. We, we seem to see that more often in other countries. Oh yeah. And we're told about that and that, that seems to affect us more than what people in our country who are also being persecuted. Yeah, the, the persecution especially in the United States is not may not necessarily be as obvious as it is in other mm -hmm. countries but it's still there. Mm -hmm. And so maybe we need to kind of open our eyes to see that persecution that is happening even now, where uh, the world is trying to silence God's word from going out, whether it be peer pressure, uh, societal pressure, uh, or maybe some other aspects. Um, and it's just something that we should keep in the back of our minds and constantly going to God in prayer and saying, okay, God, Help, our, help, help this word continue to go out in our community. And then maybe we should also add to that prayer, Lord, use me as your tool and instrument to help me go out and continue to share what you have done for us. Okay, let me go uh, uh, one more quote from uh, the early church father, or no, two more quotes, sorry. Um, they give... Uh, their awe before the Supreme Judge, so that through the dignity and prayers of the true Queen, namely the Holy Church, which is still a stranger in this world, even as it reigns in heaven together with the Lord, they might be heard by the King of the universe. 
Okay, so he's having a little poetic fun with this. So we'll just sort of humor his poetic fun. He, he does name uh, the queen, okay? So your, your th first thought might be Queen Esther, but then he moves that idea of the queen to the bride of Christ, the Holy Church, okay? Uh, and then ultimately to the great king of the universe, which is Christ. So uh, he basically says, uh, uh, before the supreme judge, who is Christ, uh, that we should be offering our prayers uh, for not only support of the queen, the bride of Christ, just as Mordecai and the Jews are going to be petitioning uh, Esther in a little bit, uh, she is that local queen, but then she's going to give of herself for her people, which is the Bride of Christ. Uh, so you get all these interesting little intrigues and parallels here, uh, which is ultimately to remain faithful to Christ himself, the King of the Universe, uh, as Mordecai refused to bow down to Haman, but to continue to keep um, his reverence to God and God alone. One little last uh, quote, and then we're going to move on to um, another quote. How many quotes do I have in here? Okay, my apologies. Okay. Uh, if someone then uh, should ask how it might be fitting to a most just king to inflict torments on the innocent, let him know that this is not the result of an evil decision, but of the command of a supreme will. Indeed, divine wisdom a wisdom which defeats every wickedness and leads things from beginning to end with its power and perfectly arranges everything, does whatever it wants in heaven and on earth, in sea and in every abyss. Okay, a few things are going on. What he's trying to answer the question is what a lot of people in today's world uh, ask is, how can a loving, gracious God allow this evil to occur? It's kind of that question uh, that is being asked here. And he basically says, uh, this is not necessarily a result of an evil decision, okay? But this is basically in the hands of God. And God is going to allow this to occur because uh, God's goodness uh, does defeat uh, the wickedness. And we will see that in action, and we need to be reminded of that. And ultimately, because we do believe that God is in control, the darkness, the wickedness has, has no influence upon God. Uh, God is the one who defeats them. Uh, we, we really shouldn't worry, but continue to put our faith and trust in God. And that God is ultimately going to do whatever God wants to do, because he is the creator of the universe. Yeah, Hilda. Um, I've been with all that's been happening mm -hmm. in the world today. Um, I've been hearing a lot of pastors or you know uh, religious people asking us. They're quoting a prayer and they're asking us to do this, and and they, it ties in very well with this. It says it's in Chron two Chronicles seven fourteen, and. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. And I, that's kind of what Mordecai is asking the people to do and uh, also what Moses asked his people to do. And I believe in today's day, that's what we are called to do, to heal our land. And so that God will forgive our sinfulness, because we've had a lot of sinfulness here. Mm -hmm. And he will heal us, protect us, and save our land. What I like about the direction where you're putting that to, you're putting it into the, the one place I actually do have control over. That's myself. I can confess my sin. I can go to God in prayer, okay? The old cliche, can I change City Hall? Some people might say, or... we can, we can try, but notice where the first focus is. Let's first come to me and say, am I a sinner? Do I need to repent? Do I need to put on sackcloth and ashes? 
and Wednesday we get to put on ashes. You don't have to wear sackcloths, okay? Uh, please just come in normal clothes, but uh, we do get the ashes, okay? Uh, and to be reminded that, yes, we have fallen short of God's glory. Instead of pointing the finger at other people and say, God, there's the problem, we start, first start with ourselves and realize that we are the sinner. We're the ones that have fallen short of God's glory. Um, and uh, yeah, that, so I do like that prayer. We need to come before God, not arrogantly, but in humility, confessing our sins and our need for a Savior. Okay, uh, so thank you for uh, sharing that uh, because it does set us the, the correct direction. And this is also where es this book of Esther is leading us because notice that Mordecai didn't sit there and say, let's gather all the Jews together and rebel against the king. He didn't do that. Instead, what did he do? He went out in the city, uh, circle so to speak, he put on the sackcloth and ashes and he started crying out. That's not trying to overthrow the government. That's crying out to God saying, Lord have mercy. Okay, one last little quote here. <clears throat> the events that occur, occur fairly so that God's faithful servants may be given into the hands of their persecutors, both for the uh, expiation of uh, sin and the correctness of their habits. As the prophet testifies, the Lord is just in all his ways and kind in all his doings. The Lord is near to all who call on him. Now, and I will admit, this is going to kind of a real hard saying because what it's really basically saying is that as Christians, we realize that we have fallen short of God's glory. And when we take a look at our lives, if we take a good look at our lives, we realize that we deserve nothing but sin. Uh, because of our sin, we deserve nothing but death and eternal da damnation. But thanks be to God, through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, He doesn't leave us there. Christ is the one that rescues us. And, but we need to realize, A, our sinfulness, and B, what God has already given to us as the answer, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so there are times where God kind of needs to kind of break down our own pride and our own arrogance. And God will allow the things of this world to go ahead and do that for the sole purpose for us to confess our sins and our need for a Savior. To be reminded, yes, the Lord is just in all his ways. We deserve that eternal damnation. But the Lord is also near to all who call upon him. Okay, let's get back to Esther here. At least for one slide. <laughs> From <laughs> Esther chapter 4, verse 4. When Esther's young women and her eunuchs came and told her, the queen was deeply distressed. She sent garments to clothe Mordecai so that he might take off his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. A couple of interesting points here. First of all, and I think somebody, and I can't remember who, sorry, mentioned it last week, that, uh, you know, Queen Esther was fairly well protected in the palace. She didn't have direct interaction with Mordecai and so was using an intermediator uh, like the young women or the eunuchs who then gave her the news that said, hey, Mordecai's in the city streets, okay, wearing sackcloth and ashes and crying out. So her response is, I don't know what's going on, but send them clothing, which is actually gifts, okay? Now, what's interesting, the queen sends gifts and Mordecai doesn't accept them. Is she already a queen there? Yeah, yeah, she's already queen. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's why it, it even says queen. Yep, so Esther is queen. And Mordecai is refusing to accept these gifts. That's making a very strong statement. Okay. Now, what's interesting about this, let me, I'm sort of putting a Pastor Bala-ism into this, mm -hmm. is that in the midst of mourning, okay, that we should be mourning, we should be returning to the Lord, we should be confessing our sins, we should be wearing sackcloth and ashes, okay, 
But the rest of the world doesn't want us to always be doing that because it's not very pleasant. It's like we're about ready to enter the season of Lent, which is a time, it's a penitential period before we celebrate the, the Feast of the Resurrection. But not all churches will really recognize the season of Lent. Some will say, well, that's just a liturgical year from a long time ago. We don't need to do that. Well, fair enough, you don't need to, but it's a great reminder. But as we do celebrate Lent, if we could call it that way, or if you want to say morning Lent, uh, we, we need to, you know, realize what's going on here and that we do confess our sins. So, yes, Mordecai is refusing the queen at this moment, okay? He's not going to a little bit later on. Uh, but for a, a greater purpose, he is going to set this time aside and cry out to God because of what's going on. Yes, Janet. I was wondering, maybe uh, Esther was afraid she might be exposed. And if they knew her association with Mordecai, maybe it would come to light. There's a little bit of that in there, but she's not. Well, she's now just aware of uh, that Mordecai is in sackcloth and ashes. She's not necessarily aware of the details why. I'm going to pick that a little bit later on uh, in a few slides when we get back uh, to Esther. But I want to do some interesting uh, parallels here. Okay. I want to pick up from Matthew chapter 22. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And then a little bit later on, verse 11, But when the king came to look at the guests, he saw there was a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So, I want you to think for a moment. Mordecai refuses the garments that Queen Esther sent. Mordecai would rather be in sackcloth and ashes crying out to God instead of taking the gifts. Um, so Mordecai could not enter the, the king's palace because of the sackcloth. And so Queen, the Queen Esther is saying, here, here's, uh, put this on instead. But he says no. And so just keep this in mind that there is a, uh, a, a beautiful connection here to putting on something so that we can enter a place. And I'm using this parable as a way of saying, let's talk about what we put on as Christians when we are baptized, we put on Christ so that we can appear before the king. Okay, It's a, a similar parallel, not exactly identical to what's going on uh, with Mordecai, but uh, I want to just develop this just a little bit more because it will help us uh, with uh, what our church father is going to lead us to. So where am I getting some of this from? From Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. For in Christ you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So St. Paul talks about us putting on Christ because without Christ, we cannot appear in God's family. We cannot appear, we cannot appear in heaven above. Okay, And so we need this garment to cover our sins, so to speak, so that we can be with God. And then from Revelation chapter 7, verse 14, I said to him, Sir, you know, and he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So scripture does like to use this idea and this illustration of a covering of our sins so that we could appear before the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords in heaven above. Okay, so yes, um, uh, Queen Esther knew that Mordecai needed to be covered of all this, but Mordecai was actually saying, no, not yet. Uh, and he has his reasons. But now let me go to the uh, church father here. 
uh, for uh, making this interesting observation. He says, we should also be careful not to pass over in silence the statement that Mordecai could not enter the royal court because he had put on sackcloth but instead got as far as the do doors to the palace, because no one who has been polluted by the life of this world may enter the court of the heavenly realm. Rather, each of us uh, should, before the last day of his life, knock on the entrance of the kingdom by chastising his body and repenting in his heart for as long as he is here. And this way, he will be fortunate to enter the paradise of the Lord after he has passed into death. So it's interesting, another little nuance is sort of brought into here with this whole concept of what are you wearing? Here the church father is basically talking about the, the sackcloth and ashes. And yeah, we, all, we should be disciplining ourselves so that we don't get caught up in the things of this world. But to also realize, in bringing in that baptismal connection, we can't appear before God uh, in sin. We need our sin covered by Christ. And so there, there's all this interesting nuance to this clothing and being covered. And I want you just to keep that in the back of your mind. And no, I don't plan these things out to this detail. But this weekend sermon is focusing on the transfiguration of our Lord, the last Sunday of Epiphany. And um, as you know, I'm doing this Epiphany theme that I kind of sort of put together here of how Jesus is being made known as the Son of God. And we heard about a lot of changing of water into wine, uh, all the different signs and miracles, the demons, even the enemies. And this last one is through his clothing. Because what does the Lucan text of the Transfiguration bring out? That even the clothing of Jesus was whiter than white. Ah, yes, clothing is very, very important. How are you clothed? How are you covered? So, um, let's see, how am I doing for time? Let's go back uh, uh, into Esther here. Verse 5. Then Esther called for Hathach, one of the king's eunuchs who had been appointed to attend her, and ordered her to go to Mordecai to learn what this was and why it was. Hathach went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate, and Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasury for the destruction of the Jews. Okay, and then let me grab one more from verse 8. Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her and uh, command her to go to the king to beg his favor and plead with him on behalf of her people. And Hathach went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. At this moment, now Esther knows the details. Before, she just knew that uh, Mordecai was in sackcloth and ashes. But now she knows the genocide of the Jews will soon take place. So now there's also another petition from Mordecai to uh, Esther that she should go to the king. But what happens if the king doesn't invite you? Okay. You don't go. You just don't show up unannounced. Well, you if you do, on the spot. <laughs> uh, you could die. Okay, we covered that earlier in the, the book of Esther. And we'll uh, end, uh, oh, this is the, the cliffhanger here, so to speak. Um, verse 10, Then Esther spoke to Hathach and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, All the king's servants and all the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law to be put to death, except to the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter, that he might live. He, he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come into the king these 30 days. So now, 
what's uh, uh, Mordecai's uh, reaction. I have time for one more slide, uh, but I can guarantee I have more, a lot to talk about it, so I'm going to repeat uh, next week uh, with this slide. Verse 12, and they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. There's a lot going on here. But Mordecai basically replies back and forth through these intermediaries. Okay, that don't think that you're going to escape. You and your father's house will also uh, be destroyed. Uh, but then verse 14 is really, really special. Relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. Talk about boldness. Talk about confidence. You know, Elijah is basically <laughs> saying uh, when he was got at his very down moment, um, I'm the only one left. God kind of laughs and says, no, there are many others that have not bowed down to Baal, okay? Mordecai basically uses that same logic, okay, that basically says, relief and deliverance will come. If it's not going to be from you, it will be from somebody else. God will raise up another person to bring that relief and deliverance. Why? Why can Mordecai be so bold? And the answer is, because of God's promise. The Messiah will come. Okay? God will save his people. He knows they cannot all be wiped out. Now, true, there are other Jews outside of uh, the provinces here. Uh, but I just love that boldness that says, yes, God will save his people. And then the last part of this, and again, I'll kind of repeat all this because it's really important for, as we begin next week, is, uh, and who knows whether you have not come to the, to the kingdom for such a time as this. Basically, maybe this is why God has put you here. So that you could be this person who's going to go and petition the king and get all this changed. So we're going to leave you at this beautiful cliffhanger. So that means you got to come back next week. <laughs> or you can read this on your own and find out the rest of the story. But uh, I'm going to be uh, refocusing on uh, this uh, beautiful statement of confidence that God is taking care of it all. Okay? You just need to do what you need to do. But let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.